Welcome to the More We Know podcast with your host and social media influencer, Mir. Gen Z's and Millennials. The host of the More We Know podcast for the Gen Z's and Millennials. I know I say that. I say it's for the Gen Z's and Millennials. And yeah, although that is the focus, this podcast is really for anyone. But I look back at my time in college and I wish I had something like this. I wish I had a podcast where I could learn from mentors or experts in their industries or, you know, fellow Gen Z's that are talking about real world topics, that are talking about what is a credit card APR, what is investing, what does all this mean? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the More We Know podcast. My name is Mir and I am your host. Today, your mentor is Ian Wishengrad. Ian Wishengrad, who's been featured on Entrepreneur.com and Adweek, is the co-founder of Three Wishes Food, the award-winning creative director, founder of Big Eyed Wish, and the host of Adweek's I'm With The Band. For me, I love the cereal because it's low sugar. I've been on a weight loss journey for the last couple of years, and to see this come out recently in the last year has been phenomenal for me because, quite frankly, I love cereal. Uh, so to have something low sugar was amazing. So Ian, it's a pleasure, and, and thank you so much for being our mentor today on the show. Cool. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And by the way, the show on Adweek is a joke on with the band. It's called I'm with the brand. I'm with the brand. I'm oh, with okay. the band. It was, a play, it was a play on I'm with the band, but yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Got it. <laughs> so, so Ian, obviously people can look you up right now and see your store. You guys have had a, a lot of hype and, and your brand has grown really quickly. And I guess I want to start it off because if people are plugging in right now and having you as the opportunity to be our mentor, can you walk us through before building, you know, a multi-million dollar brand, where did you go to school? Did you did you enjoy college? Do you recommend it? Like walk us through your background before all this business. Sure. So I'd say it all basically starts in high school. Uh, I was a, a sophomore in high school and I took a class called uh, TV production. And that's when I first found out what an iMac was and I learned what iMovie was. And I started to make movies. I would just make short little movies, assignments for class. But for some people, it was just another elective you take in between classes in Stanford Public Schools. And for me, it was like, this connects. So I, I had fun making movies. I made fake commercials. And it just became a passion of mine. So then I got my own computer, started working in Final Cut Pro, and really took to like filming, writing, editing, and really wanted to go into film or advertising, I felt. And so I wound up going to um, the Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University. And that's like a, you know, a pretty good communication school. Um, So I basically knew in high school, um, I'd won some small local awards that I knew I had some sort of strength in film and television and and storytelling. Um, And then so in in college, I just kind of came in, knew what I wanted to do. I had fun, but I really pursued continued storytelling and filmmaking. I did internships at like big ad agencies in New York. I did internships at Paramount Pictures in Los Angeles. So I really knew it was either like film or advertising and I'm super duper ADHD. And I just felt I didn't also, Hollywood felt like a lot of who you know and less of a meritocracy. And it felt like a gamble. And I didn't necessarily have a dream of winning an Oscar. So advertising felt more fun to me because it felt a little bit more of a meritocracy. It felt like um, you could make a bunch of movies a year because you do different commercial shoots and the turnarounds faster. And I also like the idea of advertising as kind of creativity with performance attached to it. It's not just like that subjective. Um, yeah, you could say I didn't like the ad or I don't like the ad, but ultimately if you're running an ad and it performed, it worked. And so there's a scoreboard uh, where film is, a, is much more subjective, I think. So anyway, I kind of knew I liked advertising worked for different ad agencies along the way, built brands, um, started my own agency when I was 28 years old. I'd done a bunch of different fun, buzzy ideas uh, and still have my agency. But I think I saw ultimately as you you evolve as a human, as you grow, you keep looking at, well, what's the best return on my time so long as I enjoy what I do? And I love advertising and I love the creative process of coming up with ideas and marketing brands. But it also kind of dawned on me that if I could find a way to create my own brand, that would be a really good use of time. And it's not like, oh, I hope this client renews me or the project's over or this happens. It felt like you have, you know, I I had years under my belt. I learned that I could make money, hire people, provide for my family. That was like one big aha evolution on my entrepreneurial journey. And the next one was, okay, can I take it up a notch? Can I really, you know, build and scale a company? Because if I put all my energy into building brands for other people, there's only so much I can do or so much my team can do. Um, but ultimately, if I could create enough hype and build the right product for myself, for my family, and and spend all my time growing that, that could be incredibly rewarding. And also, 
you know, in the advertising world, it's either a project or a retainer. Retainer meaning they hire you every month and you get paid X dollars a month to do services or a project. You know, the project's X, you make this profit and you keep hunting for projects. The way I kind of looked at it, if you have a good packaging and a good product, you can go get a retainer from everyone in America. Because if everyone gives me a five, six, seven dollar a month retainer or weekly retainer from buying my cereal, you get them. You just have to keep getting more people into the brand and, and the product and brand speak for itself. So that is my journey from high school to where I am today. That's amazing. And, and on that journey, did your parents, were they entrepreneurial? Were they, you know, regular corporate careers? What was their role in this? But uh, yeah, both my parents worked for themselves. My mom had her own, uh, my mom had her own um search firm. So she would basically, she was an executive search person. So if you needed someone in, in Wall Street to like become a portfolio manager of a company, she would help find that executive. So she had her own small company. And my dad also had his own small company. And uh, on that journey, would you consider them as your mentors? Or did you have other mentors that guided you? Hey, look, try this, try that. Um, my parents encouraged me uh, they saw my passion. They encouraged my passion. They saw once I found something I was good at, they said, yeah, you should keep doing this. Um, but they weren't necessarily pushing entrepreneurship. They were just pushing, stick to what you're good at. Don't lie to yourself. Um, and no, along the way, I've, I've had many, many different mentors and do to, to this day, they all serve different purposes. It's like my own little board of directors. This one is good for life advice. This one's good for professional. This one is this. And what happens along the way is you learn to ingratiate yourself from different people. And it's not like, hey, you're my mentor. You just build a relationship with someone that's 20 plus years older than you who sees themselves in you or sees your promise. And so when you're very respectful and ask for their time, they know that you're a winner and they think, you know, they'd like to help you along your journey. So you earn your mentors. I, I love that you say that because a lot of, you know, my age group, I'm a Gen Z, I'm 23. Most of the people that listen to this are, are 21. We, we feel almost nervous to find those mentors because we feel like, hey, what can we offer these mentors? You know, these people are already extremely successful. What can we do differently that can actually uh, ingratiate their time? So for you, you know, would you say the biggest thing is showing them appreciation, respect and saying, hey, I just want to learn, you know, when these people are extremely busy already? You have to be very specific. You have to be, you have to be going for something specific. Um, it's kind of like you could, anyone could get a mentor. I mean, I don't think that's it. Uh, I think finding the right voice. And also, I mean, the best thing is looking for someone who you look at and go, I want to be something like you in the future. That's flattering. And you really understand and know them and you have specific asks and that you just look like a ball of potential. So all they're really doing is going, yeah, you're worth my time. You, you fight tooth and nail, no matter what it takes to get that meeting politely persistent. And that's kind of life life. Just polite persistence is, is my mantra. Um, I mean, my first mentor took eight months. He canceled on me eight times. His assistant was saying he's busy. It was like, I was giving up, but now, by the way, this mentor didn't make or break my life either. Right. I mean, I'm glad we have a good relationship, but I could have also gotten where I've gotten to with, without him, but it was cool to have him and make him a friend. And then he likes you, follows you, you keep someone up to date and then they, and then they're on your journey. Then they're, Oh, oh I love, I, 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 he's a good friend of mine. And that's kind of just, you know, how it is. And I have a bunch of those people, but you have to work for it. Yeah, polite persistence. I love that. I hope people are listening to that. that that's, a, that's a great way to look at it. And that, that just goes to the lesson of in life, a lot of things are sales. So I, I really want to get into three wishes because you guys are in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, basically every Whole Foods nationwide now? It's coming, come August. Yes. August will be in every Whole Foods. Right now we're in Southern California and we're in the Northeast. We're in over 2000 stores in general. Uh, but yes, Whole Foods will be in every single one come August. So to get into that space, the CPG space, whether people want to launch maybe a cereal or a protein bar, the industry is unequivocally extremely competitive, right? And and, it, and it's hard to kind of break in and, you know, be that, get into Whole Foods. Uh, obviously, you've had tremendous success now. How did, how did you come up with three wishes? What was, was this vision that you think was going to grow as fast as it did? Um, but there's a bunch of different questions. So I always wanted to have my own brand. It didn't need to be cereal. It just needed to look like from the a minute you hear the idea, you go, that's an opportunity. Uh, you know, I was always like, oh my God, someone thought mattresses could be reinvented. Someone thought shoes, someone thought glasses, razors. Like, I just don't think like that. And my wife came up with this idea. Our son Ellis was six months old. Uh, I think we always kind of were looking for opportunities. And then, you know, she was like cereal. And I'm like, oh my God, 
<laughs> yes. Like I can't, there's no Casper or Harry's or Dollar Shave Club or whatever away of cereal. I'm like th- cereal. Yes. Genius. Okay. So that was it. I mean, that was the aha moment. I mean, it took us two years to develop the product. Uh, it, it's expensive to develop the product. We took profits out of the agency and found food scientists and labs and it's just, it's very difficult uh, to make. You can't just like go practice in your kitchen like you could with some other dishes like a pasta sauce or something else. So yeah, and then I think the reason that we've had such success, um, we have some really, you know, great strategic advisors, friends, investors. I didn't, you know, I think another really important piece of advice is do not lie to yourself. Know what you're good at, know what you're not good at. My wife and I are perfect compliments. She's an incredible operator numbers, details. I am at sales, marketing, relationships. Those are those are really complementary skill sets. On top of it, we still have good friends and advisors and people that help set a really good strategy for us. So we've really avoided a lot of mistakes that a lot of first-time food entrepreneurs would make. And we also learned a lot from our clients. I mean, we still have clients at, at different stages, big, big ones, startups, retail, direct to consumer. And so you learn a lot by working closely with entrepreneurs as you help them build their businesses. And then most importantly is we have a really great product and we did go into the market knowing that there was some real innovation. And if you look at cereal as a category, yeah, there's like innovation, but it's like a new flavor, a new donut collaboration, a new something. It wasn't like someone really broke down cereal and rebuilt it with incredibly different ingredients, changed the whole macro macrobiotic profile and it still tastes good. So People were looking for something because the category was in decline. Most people don't think about going like, oh, crypto. Crypto is getting hot. Like run into that. Whatever is getting hot, people run into. The opportunity we saw was the category was not dying, but there was attrition. And so we saw that as an opportunity. But what a way to capitalize on that. And, you know, but for a lot of food entrepreneurs and quite frankly, in a lot of industries, there's the fear of the big dogs, the, the big people. So did you ever have that fear in your mindset where, you know, if, if Kellogg catches on to us doing this, they got they got all this money, they can go launch a, a, a lotion. Yeah, cereal. What- I think we still have we still have that fear. I think a healthy amount of fear from everywhere. Of who knows what's who's coming out with what. But that could be um, I've learned just as an entrepreneur, like worrying about other things you can't control is very paralyzing and you can't really spend too much time doing that. So you need to focus on ultimately it's not just a product for product is our product the best in the category. I believe. Yes. So obviously have a great product. Um, but you got to kind of play your own game and you got to focus on yourself because you can get lost. Just looking side to side. You got to be the horse with the blinders on, stay focused, keep your strategy and play your own hands and trust that, Yes. Could all the big guys go make a product, make it cheaper, put it in cute packaging? Sure. Um, I don't think they necessarily could build a brand that much faster. Distribution and packaging is not a brand. And a brand is seeing the community and people love it. And they know the story. It's not just what, you know, and don't get me wrong. They have brands. They have, but those brands took decades to build. So that's that's a major key right there i, I can appreciate that especially because that's that's something that makes people kind of push back that they have that unequivocal fear so uh we appreciate that so in that in that process of the two years of you building it you know you're running a profitable agency uh was there any sort of doubt within the two years where you're like i should just go back to this i'm spending so much money on this or were you certain the whole way through no i knew that this was the cereal is a really tremendous opportunity and nothing will that 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 became like i was put on earth to kind of do this and do this with my wife we were working together on the agency and we work well together but we work much better together in this because we're really it's you need so many you need so much doing it's like it can't even explain to you just how much work there is um and this kind of business is like a full business You've got supply chain, ingredients, marketing, sales, distribute. Like there's so many elements to it where an ad agency, no knock on my agency, but you're like, you're all working for a CMO or a founder. And it's the same thing over and over again, which is exciting because it's different. Every project's different. And that's what's great for my ADD. Like, <laughs> oh, that's a new one. That's a new one. That's a new one. Um, but the other one is like a real business with inventory and factoring. And uh, it's just like, it's so much more robust. Right, right. And then, you know, within within building that the what's the what's the trial period like, you know, for 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 someone looking back at, at this journey now, you know, especially launching something that took two years to build. How exciting was it to have that final product where you like you and your wife were like, that's it. 
Yes. Yes. All that is super duper. I mean, there's so many cool, exciting things that, and, and they're happening more frequently now, which is cool. So I had to go to the airport the other day and a dude sitting next to me while we went for the plane. And I said, Oh, what do you do? Are we doing the BS? Blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden I said through, she's like, Oh my God, my wife has that. We like the pink box. Like, that's yeah. cool. You know, I got stopped somewhere and like, I believe that kind of stuff happens more and more as the brand gets out there more and people know it. So that like the, the, the brands growing and people know it thing is super cool. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And so someone's listening to this right now. They're, they just graduated college. They don't want to go the corporate lifestyle and they want to go launch their own thing, whether it's a protein bar or whether it's their own, you know, app, what's, what's the greatest piece of advice you could give them? Well, I worked for other people for six years and really mastered my craft and my craft was advertising and on this. So I don't have much advice for the people that just go for it from day one. They're inevitably going to burn their hand 10,000 times, but that's, I burn my hand working for other people. Like, so you've got to learn, you learn by making mistakes. I would say, try to surround yourself with really smart people. Make sure you have a really sound strategy and, you know, don't take no for an answer. That's kind of just, you know, as I said, like the polite persistence thing, but, um, there, I don't have much faith in people coming out of college, just going to do stuff. Um, because those people coming out of college just to do stuff, those are the same people that have been doing stuff since they're 15 or 16. Like there's no, if they've been hustling since then, then they went to college just to get a piece of paper and then like nothing's going to stop them. It doesn't matter what they do. They just understand business. They understand, got to make, can't spend, got to make, can't spend, got to make. But if you're like fresh out of college and you just think it's a good idea to go try something on your own and you don't have that just fire burning inside of you, then I would say that's a recipe for, for a tough ride. Yeah. And you really need that grit. You, you mentioned something earlier that was really interesting about when you were looking at the Hollywood life and getting into movies that there's this sense of who, you know, as opposed to the work itself, would you say in the entrepreneurial world, there's a little bit of that as well, you know, being connected to VCs, connected to certain individuals, connected to people in supply chain. Is, is it a lot of that, or is it way more on the work ethic? How, how, how bad do you want it? Well, now in hindsight, candidly, I could have gone to Hollywood. I didn't realize like, so because yeah, it's who, you know, but I could have gone, I could have go made them know who I am. I just think deep down, I didn't like Hollywood. I didn't want to go play it. It's a little too superficial and it's too gainy for me, but I could have played it now in hindsight. So I think everything is just your ability to who, you know, like are some people born with great networks? Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. I go, I've assembled mine entirely. So no matter what, life comes down to great relationships, but they can't be transactional. You have to genuinely be a person that loves to connect with people and make friends and realize that making friends, real friends, uh, friends meaning mentors, friends meaning anything is just, it's it's somewhat innate and you have to understand this. And then there's the, then there are those people out there that are those like just animals, those like Gary V type animals that are just like, you know, on some other kind of wavelength. That's not, you know, I have the same, I think fire and hunger. I just don't wear it in the same fashion. And I'm trying to be a little kind of artful about how I go about things, but either way you need that crazy grit, go for it. Like I'm very immune to hearing no, I doesn't buy like in deep, a lot of people, most people really like no is, 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 is like, but I have so much kind of confidence that like, you're going to look like an idiot. They, whoever says no to me, I'm going to like, I'm so sure at some point in time in the future, I'm going to be able to look back at you and go, I knew it. you were an idiot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that polite persistence again. And rejection is just an obstacle to move us forward. Right. So, I mean, obviously now you're about to be in Whole Foods nationwide, but at some point were there rejections and no's from Whole Foods? Um, no. I mean, I would give credit to a really sound strategy and polite persistence. And so you knew, did you know from day one of the launch that you would get as big as you've gotten this quick? Um, so far, you know, candidly, we've kind of like sticking to our business plan and we're hitting our numbers. So I think now the question is, what do we need to do to continue to, to bring more awareness to it, to outperform, to keep growing? But yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is just the instinct, my instinct without my wife, without other people would be go everywhere, get that box. 
If that retailer takes you, this one takes you, go, go, go. And that is a very undisciplined, expensive called channel strategy. So the fact that our channel strategy is staying right now, pretty much in the natural, we have a couple exceptions, but we're in the healthier stores and we're building there. And then we're in the healthier online stuff and we're doing that. And we're not just going to every Ralph's, Vons, Albertson, Shop and Stop, like whatever, any kind of basically conventional grocery store. Um, it costs a lot of money to do that. And what you learned is investors want to see that you have what's called velocity, meaning in a, in a, in a supermarket, the way they make money is they give you this much real estate. How quickly can you run product through there, right? How efficient can you make their real estate? So focusing on making your products high velocity items is much more important for your future health fundraising exits, anything you want to do, just business in general, than just showing, hey, look, I'm in 20,000 doors, but you're moving two boxes on average, like a week. That's not a good idea. So yeah. So high velocity is, is the key there unequivocally. And, and, uh, and, and your, your niche specific, right? You're not, you're not stretching your arms too wide to try to do every type of cereal. You're, you're so focused in your category, which is why you're able to see such immense success. Don't you say a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes want to dive into too many pools yeah they say most people um i forget it is it's die of like not personally die of but it's like die of i forget i'm blowing it but it's the point is you it's so tempting to just kind of yo you got a brand i could now put my you know anything fits i could go stick my label on it it's called Hola. i put the mic back in can you hear me oh good yeah yeah can you hear me can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, it's called skewing out. Like each one's a skew, right? We've got cinnamon, honey, fruity, whatever. Those are skews. And then all of a sudden you could just go into other categories, you know, and anything that fits and just called skewing out. And some brands do that because when you, you could get on this, this thing where you start taking venture capital money and you get a big valuation and you're trying to now, now you kind of work for other people. We raise a small amount of money, which we've never disclosed, but it's, we have complete control of our own company and that's how we want it to be. There's a point where you grow, you do really well, you take on a lot of money. Other people start having board seats. You start having to make certain financial numbers. You basically start working for other people. And there's no like money that comes, you don't get money unless you earn it through margin and your own revenue growth that doesn't turn into basically you start working with other people. And if right. you have to hit numbers, what's the easiest way to hit numbers? Oh, well, they like three wishes this. Let's make three wishes this. Let's make three wishes this. And we'll get here and here and here. And um, that's a strategy. But we're not, it's a little early for us to do that. And in terms of, you know, raising capital, what, what happens to an entrepreneur that they just quite frankly don't have the money, but they have the idea, they want to start something. What do you do if you don't have the money? You have to convince other people to give you money. And that was a very humbling experience. I, I thought I'd raise money really quickly and it was really, really hard. It was, that was like the most surprising thing of the whole, the whole process, how hard it is to actually get. And it makes you realize you're not as cool as you think. You're not as successful as you think. You're not, you're just not because you know, if they really believed in you, they'll cut the check. These are all people that could cut checks. So they were basically saying, I don't, I don't believe in you. And that's, but you know, I don't really dwell on that. You're just trying to keep get in front of more people and keep selling and selling and selling. And eventually it all came in. And then you hit a cool tipping point where it was like hard to raise money. And then within months you're in this door, you're in this and everyone now wants to come and give you money. So that's kind of the irony of it. And for, you know, as, as we transition here into the conclusion for, for three wishes, when did you know that I'm obviously you always, you and your wife knew that this is it, this is going to take off. You spent two years working on it. So there was no way you're going to flop on I it. it was going to work when we got the three wishes trademark, that was like, that was some, that was some spiritual shit. Like our last name is wishing grad. I never <laughs> thought we had so many trademark problems with other names. We came up with it. I mean, Margaret came up with it. We were with our son in the stroller. We went right back. We had a, I was having a beer outside of the central park boathouse. We got married at the central park boathouse. The product was coming along. We just got rejected on another trademark. We realized our packaging wasn't working. Like we weren't in market, but we were testing it. We were walking into Whole Foods, like mock-up packaging and putting it on the shelf. And we're like, and I'm like, God damn. And when she said it, I'm like, if we can get three wishes and once it was clear and we got the trademark, I'm like, wow, this is kind of in the stars. Obviously it's not. And I'm not like a superstitious person or I'm just like, we're still busting our ass, like whatever to make it happen. It's happening because we're making it happen. But it felt like this is meant to be, 
we got the trademark of three wishes. This is, this is pretty amazing. Like, I don't, I know wow. for certain a lot of guys, girls, anyone, whatever women who have a food startup, they do a startup and it's very hard for them to ever do another one as big. And I just think I'll have many businesses in my life. Uh, I enjoy this so much, but I don't think we will ever have anything like three wishes. Like that's just kind of, it's all kind of full circle. You, you get a little, things start to like, I said, you work really hard, but things also fall into place a little bit. And that's cool when you start to feel like, wow, things are like really thought this through getting into shelf. People just like it. It's just kind of working. Wow. Like that is, yeah. special. I don't want to pretend that I could go just run it back and do it again or figure this out. Like you could have the strategy once everyone, there's a playbook, you could have the money, you could have this. It's hard to create a little bit of, you know, special magic. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a way for it to come full circle with your last name and the trademark finally coming in that, that persistence. Wow. That's I know people that are in that space would just would love to hear that, you know, and on a different note, right. So I brought on Chris Hunter from Koya before, and he said there was a moment that, you know, that Koya could have shifted completely when they had their drinks, you know, it ended up some type of contamination and the business could have shifted completely. But the key is, you know, leaders like you know how to bounce back and, and fight through that. Was there any moment within three wishes that if you had to make a game time, a critical decision that could have effectively affected the whole business if you didn't make that decision? Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, not like that. <laughs> We've not had any like food safety stuff like that. So, um, but all, every day there's always something. I mean, there's like, we've, we've had, we have to raise prices. We don't want to raise prices. We're $5.99 at shelf. That's a good price point. Now we're going to have to fix 99 basically, but we got to run a good business. We're trying to run that business well, and you just can't run it with a bad margin. And when costs are growing everywhere, when you thought they were going to decrease, but inflation's kicking in and it turns out we're not the only one and everyone's going there. So does it make me happy to be a six ninety nine cereal? Hell no. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know what? Like that's that's what it is. That's what's happening in the economy. So you know, yeah, you know, yeah. That's, that's it. And and a lot of people might see your entrepreneur.com article about how you guys building this brand so fast, it's making millions of dollars, and they might be like, "Wow, I need to do that too." But realistically, how many hours are you working a day? How many hours do you work a week? Oh. I kill. I love working. I have no idea. I work all the time. I'm my brain, like it just goes. I can't explain it. You can't. I have to be told put your phone down or like it's time to be <laughs> elsewhere. Other than that, I'm like always thinking about it. But it doesn't feel like work. That's what's cool. Like if you love what you do, it never really feels like you're working. Wow, wow. So that you could you could just hear the passion in your voice. And and what what does your daily success routine look like? Outside of, are you working out? Do you I have podcast? I have two kids. I have a puppy. I love like, it's the routine is get up at five, something, take the dog out to pee. <laughs> then the dog poo, hang with your kids, get them dressed, brush their teeth. It's been COVID. It's been weird. So, you know, my son's going to go to camp and school again. That's amazing. And, and work. I mean, every day is different. That's what's kind of fun. I don't have a nine to five. I don't have, I'm not that routinized. Yeah. Yeah. That's the true entrepreneur. And then what, what, you know, Ian, kind of the last question here, what, what, what keeps you up at night? Like, and everything's going good. You, you're phenomenal. You have the energy, but what does keep you up where you have a fear sometimes of whether it's in the business or in life? It's always money. <laughs> it's always like, you know, you want to make sure, like, I think, you know, we're going to three wishes. We don't, we don't draw salaries, you know, where we put all the money into the business. We need the business to grow. We want to focus on that. So, you know, you have employees, you have people I want, I want to keep everyone and always do stuff. And so you've always got to, you know, there's like always a juggling act. So, you know, we're not like uh, rich retired people yet. So I want to be always kind of thinking about money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. M money's important. And, and for people graduating today, would, would your best advice be for them to go work, work somewhere, even if you hate it, even if you hate the corporate world, no, no, just no. go nothing to hate. No, 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 no. I would never, ever tell someone to go do something they hate. Um, I think they need to figure out the combination of what do you, what are, what are you passionate about or you think, and what are you good at doing, focusing time on stuff you're not good at is a waste of time. If you just really work hard at something you love, that's that you'll, you'll get there. That, that, that's the recipe. And, and for people that want to buy three wishes now, obviously you're not in every Whole Foods yet, but that's coming in August. Online. Where can we go get it? You go to threewishescereal.com, you go to Amazon, you can go to Sprouts, you can go to, depends. I mean, there's no, you will find us and you could order us no problem. And where can people find you on social media if they want to follow you and your journey? Uh, I'm at Icy Wish. 
Okay, for sure. We'll, we'll include all that. So that is Ian Wishingrad, who just was our mentor today. We got to learn about the ins and out of the business world, how to launch the competition. And just, I think the biggest takeaway, at least for me, for again, this is the more we know is the polite persistence. I think that's a huge concept that I think people can take away from this. So really, really appreciate you taking the time and, and educating us today. Thanks for having me, man. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Ian. Hey, thanks again. That was really